Hi, Jeff. It's great to be with you. Hi, Jason. Good to be with you, too. How are you doing today? Good, good. Uh, for folks who um, aren't familiar with Jeff Polari, Jeff's a friend of mine who uh, actually has uh, just come out with a book on uh, tarot symbolism, and he has developed not only a very insightful and innovative interpretation of the symbology of tarot, but designed a whole game around it involving hand gestures. Uh, I was yeah. struggling before we went on air to find this copy. I thought my fiance Nassim actually took it to work with her. She's been sketching hands based on the hand gestures in your book. Really? So That's so cool. With this copy. Anyway, it's great to be with you, Jeff. Uh, by the well, way, I'm gonna put a description in the link to that book for anybody who wants to uh, check out um arcane arcade i haven't read that yep. many books on tarot but i can tell you this much uh having read for example whitley streber's book the path which goes into the, tar the symbolism of the tarot of marseille this is certainly much more groundbreaking work than that one so i would definitely recommend it to everybody well thanks thanks yeah and if you have questions you can always message me about it too i love talking about it and striber is a great lead-in to what i first wanted to talk about with your book Uberman, uh, the dedication, first part of the book, dedicated to Ikaru and people of his kind. So we're talking about the star people, uh, humanity's hybrid offspring. And I draw Stryber into that because he's also connected to the uh, closer encounter phenomenon with his uh, book Communion. So I just thought I would love for you to expand a little bit more on, you know, why you decided to dedicate the book to those people. Well, you know, on an intellectual and a theoretical level, I could say that um, most of my work is really about evolution. I mean, the most fundamental concept of my entire uh, philosophical framework is that of the spectral revolution. And the spectral revolution is really an evolutionary revolution. You know, the term specter that's at the root of um, this concept means that which is to come. And so it signifies uh, the process of becoming that I take to be ontologically fundamental. And um, in this, you know, a flux conception of the nature of reality, which goes back ultimately to Heraclitus, uh, in some sense also to Gautama, there is an undoing of binary oppositions because you know uh, spectral also signifies the spectrum so in a spectrum you see that what appear to be uh distinct categories or um uh you know um things that have a the, a definite designation like one or another color are actually part of a, a spectrum and so in the course of the evolutionary process uh i think fixed terms and definite entities um, are revealed to actually be transitory phases, uh, mm -hmm. a uh, transformative development that sure. is about uh, sustaining novelty and creativity forwards into the future. So considering the fact that the brunt of my philosophical work in general is evolutionary, um, I think it's fitting to dedicate a book on the Uberman or what uh, transcends or overcomes humanity to the future stage of our evolution, to the race that is going to ultimately uh, metamorphosize out of man and supplant mere humanity. Yes, that is so fascinating. The way that you describe this process, um, I almost saw this evolution of humanity you're referring to with beings like Ikaru it's almost like a fifth force in the technological singularity. We have AI, nano, genetic engineering, VR, uh, stuff you describe in World State of Emergency. But in this book, you seem to almost imply that we also have this superorganism, uh, you know, the zebra, uh, as Philip K. Dick calls it, that's also playing a hand in this. And I found it interesting that there seems to be a parallel um, where the, you place the Olympians landing in 2048 and that seems to be around the same time as the technological singularity. And so I'm wondering, almost like when I read when I read that, I felt like, is there like a checkmate going on? You know, is if one hand shows to the other hand show, is this why we don't have a wider disclosure? You know, both of them are waiting to, to do this. And I know that you say that the Olympians are planning on 
uh, seeing, you know, coming and swooping in as humanity saviors after, you know, humanity is on the ropes, basically. Yeah, so, you know, again, um, from a theoretical standpoint, it makes sense to uh, designate 2048 as the year of full disclosure, as it were, or the year that these uh, Olympians or Nordics, whatever you want to call them, these sort of Scandinavian looking, you know, overlords are going to openly declare themselves and attempt to uh, more overtly consolidate control over the planet. It makes sense because most projections, um, you know, from people in the transhumanist community and, uh, you know, the tech circles in Silicon Valley are that the technological singularity will take place by the year 2050. And so what I've always argued is that there's no way that these beings who have been attempting to uh, manipulate our history and to slow and derail our progress at various junctures, there's no way that they're going to allow us to achieve technological parity with them, which among other things would mean that we had the capacity to defend ourselves. And so they would have to intervene at some point before the technological singularity. Yeah. So, you know, that makes sense uh, just, you know, on theoretical grounds. But as I suggested in my answer with Ikiru, uh, you know, uh, regarding Ikiru and the dedication of this book to the coming race, um, as I suggested and, and didn't elaborate on, I have other reasons beyond the theoretical for why I did this. And so, you know, I've had certain glimpses of, I think, let's just say a very possible future. I think that all precognition is only a question of probabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the last thing I would do is affirm any fatalistic uh, vision of the future. So I think, you know, I, I have had probabilistic glimpses of the future and the impression I always get of this event, which I describe rather vividly in Faustian Futurist, the book to which Uberman is a sequel, is that, you know, these folks are going to basically step out of black limousines. They're not going to land in flying saucers. They're going to step out of black limousines uh, and wow. give speeches at podiums um, you know, uh, of major international institutions round about, I think, the year 2048. Uh, that's the sense that I got. And, you know, I also gave that proviso to my response regarding Ikiru, because to be quite honest with you, and I mean, these are things I've never talked about publicly before, uh, wearing my hat thus far as a, you know, an objective researcher working in parapsychology and so forth. But I, I've seen these beings. I've you know, had glimpses of, of these, be not more than glimpses, I have had visions of these beings um, who f frankly look like people out of Japanese anime. Uh, you know, I've always wondered where the hell the Japanese got this image from. The <laughs> characters in Japanese anime don't look Japanese. These very angular faces, pointed yeah. chin, large Actually, eyes, platinum blonde hair. Wow. Yeah. I was going to say that my favorite, you know, character of all fictional literature is Alita, which is she also has the large eyes and yeah, has that again, you're like you said, that's not Japanese looking, you know, and so we have this sort of uh, precog authorization happening from the future to kind of bring this cultural, you know, basis in. Um, and I think that is really I'm really like honored that you come out and you share that info because I think you really did come out really strongly in this book, sharing so many personal details about your life. Um, for instance, Star Child, that chapter in the book, uh, you know, it, it's, it seems to be about E.T., but I think the, the undercurring narrative of that is really it's about you. You are uh, this being who is, you know, doing the work of bridging humanity to, you know, what people think of as extraterrestrial in a way, you know, you're bringing them forward in the way that, you know, people think that Spielberg made, you know, E.T. like a relatable form of what aliens could be. Because before E.T., you know, we had uh, Ridley Scott type level aliens that everyone would be terrified by. And so, you know, that's also your legacy. Your father helped to write the original screenplay of E.T. And uh, I think, you know, that fact that you're doing something similar with this book. I think that's something to really, you know, pick up on this pattern of your work. You know, when you're talking about the evolution, you're you're pushing it forward. Yeah, it's interesting. We should clarify for the viewers 
mm -hmm. uh, before uh, you know uh, there are any legal issues with with Spielberg. Uh, that what uh, Jeff is referring to is a chapter in Uberman where for the first time publicly, I relate um, some hitherto closely guarded information about the fact that my father, uh, who was an aspiring filmmaker, made a couple of, uh, you know, fairly low budget films, let's say, uh, but who was uh, for many years an aspiring filmmaker wrote a screenplay in the late 1970s together with a Persian collaborator, uh, a painter by the name Khosro Yahyoi, painter and later novelist, Khosro Yahyoi. Uh, and the two of them together in the late 70s in my father's apartment uh, in New York, wrote this screenplay called Star Child, which uh, I use as the title for one of the chapters in Uberman. And uh, Long story short, I mean, people have to read this for themselves in Uberman, but long story short, the typist, okay, so my father, you know, in the late 1970s, hadn't been in America for very long, and neither he nor his collaborator spoke very, or wrote very good English. So they hired a typist who kind of not only typed, but also, uh, you know, wasn't only responsible for stenography, but also kind of cleaned up this screenplay for them as she typed it. And this woman, Melissa Matheson, got involved with Sp uh, Steven Spielberg or was involved at the time with Steven Spielberg. And there's actually a special thanks to her in the credits for E.T. That's the real giveaway there. Yeah. Uh, so my father basically, long story short, uh, you know, went and saw E.T., walked out of the theater incensed and called the law office, uh, most of whose attorneys read the screenplay and said, there's no question that this is E.T. Uh, it's almost taken scene for scene. And uh, so, you know, a, a drama unfolded from there, which if re if uh, viewers are interested, they can read about in Uberman. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool details about that. That's really like the general principle. But the reasons why, you know, that we don't know about this, you know, it speaks to a kind of conspiracy that has to do with you, you know, that's a deeper level, I think, and it represents the kind of potentiality that you have, um, which also is spoken to in many ways throughout the book, you know, your premonitions, the dreams you have um, that come through with that. I love hearing about those dreams. That was one of my favorite parts of this book, was getting to kind of see what's going on inside your dream world. It's a dark place, um, so so dark that you can see the shadow of the griffin passing over you at night. I thought that was just phenomenal. Um, and I love how you even give your little bit of your interpretation with that as well. Um, and so, yeah, that's something about the book that I thought was just so cool um, because you do transcend this uh, public private distinction, um, you know, pulling in stuff from your personal life and, you know, going beyond what anyone else would really done in a book before you know you you do it so meta and i think that's really brave and you know also how dark you get at the same time you know tragic um but also humorous i found humor uh rampant throughout this novel i loved uh, i was laughing um at the beginning parts just like i can't believe he's doing this he's going there wow and it's it just like you know it just fits the, the you know your general you you constantly one up yourself every time you know you're such an up winger and you did it again with this book, and uh, yeah I like how you said uh, you know how people will respond to this book will say a lot about you you know and uh, I just said you know when I saw this I was like wow I really do love this book and I I think that might have something to do with the fact that I have embraced my own other and I think that is something that we are challenged with with your work is to you know embrace the full potential of you know the human the human and also the extraterrestrial as well so yeah i i thought that uh you could respond to any of that you can sure sure let me uh start at the top there um i've been asked about the dreams in this uh book uh before but what i neglected to mention in a previous interview um is that as far as i can remember Every dream that I recount in that book is actually a dream that I've had. Other than, uh, I mean, the dreams that are relevant to me in the, you know, myself as a character yeah, in the right. book. The dream that, for example, 
toward the end, there's this, and I don't want to, you know, give away too much for people who haven't read it, but for those who have already read it, uh, there's this dream that Dana Avalon, the protagonist, has of um, this character Adolfo, Adolfo von Sielstrung, as a child. And that I, yeah. that I invented, okay? That's fiction. I invented that um, mm -hmm. based on some research about the Austrian painter and some intuitions also that I have about uh, how he met his end. So that's invented, but the dreams that uh, are relevant to my autobiography, uh, as far as I can recall, I didn't make a single one of those up. I, those were all actually experiences that I've had. Um, so the autobiographical portion of Uberman extends far beyond the second chapter, which is just literal autobiography. A lot of the other stuff that I talk about uh, in terms of my childhood and, and dream experiences and so forth um, throughout the years uh, are all basically autobiography. Yeah, I, I hear you there. And I, that's what I was really, you know, gratified to get to know you so much better. And like I said, one of the things I picked up on a lot was your sense of humor, you know, with what how far you went with what you were doing. And I thought, you know, it might be helpful to like have you reflect a little bit on what role you think humor and tricksterism, tricksterism kind of plays in our times, you know, or with our origins or what our response might be to like cosmic horror. I think it's tremendously important. That's an excellent question. And uh, I think people should go and read the essay I wrote on Batman in Lovers of Sophia, where I um, study the archetype of the Joker. And um, there are things I say about humor in that essay that connect back to, let's say, my discussion of Hermes or Mercury in uh, Prometheus and Atlas, which, uh, yeah, which reveal the deepest stratum of my thought uh, in a way like, you know, my, my work is unquestionably tragic and um, it's, a, it's a dark abyss in many ways, but uh, there's laughter up from out of the bottom of that abyss. Yeah. And I think that it's vital not to lose our sense of humor and to be able to engage with the uh, hyperdimensional intelligence that I think has been um, catalyzing human evolution throughout the millennia, it's important to engage with that intelligence uh, from out of a very strong sense of humor. Because mm -hmm. if we if we think too literally, and if you know, all of our praxis is constrained by categorical judgments, you know, whether they're uh, categorical judgments having to do with the structure of knowledge or whether it's, you know, um, thinking too, in too structured a manner about ethics and politics, we are going to continue to be undermined in a fundamental way by this superhuman intelligence. Uh, that can only really be engaged uh, in a more playful manner. And so, you know, I think it's important to remember that even though I've structured an entire movement around Prometheus, and Prometheus in certain ways seems like this tragic, heroic uh, freedom fighter, right? And martyr. Yes. Uh, Prometheus albeit as a freedom fighter, is very different from other, you know, tragic hero and martyr figures uh, in the symbology of various religions in that he's fundamentally a trickster. So yeah. I pointed this out in Prometheus and Atlas that, you know, Prometheus within the domain of the Titans is a kind of mirror to Hermes or Mercury. Mm -hmm. it, you know, that alchemical Mercury is his element. And I think that it's only from out of that kind of consciousness that we're going to be able to constructively grapple with this catalytic force uh, that's been attempting to foster human evolution um, and has repeatedly restructured various societies uh, throughout the course of history and prehistory. Uh, the, the most significant example being one that's been occulted from us, namely the destruction of Atlantis. Atlantean society 
was ultimately destroyed due to its lack of a sense of sense of humor. Yeah, that is such a fascinating thing. And it does tie into, I think, uh, the imperative of Atlas. And to me, when I think about humor, especially in regards to the trickster archetype, I sort of see it as like indicative of the kind of um, motley clash of paradigms that we have to be able to grapple with, you know, at the same time, seeing that the ground of being is like, you know, nothingness and there are, you know, it's chaos or there's nothing fixed. But at the same time, we're forging an identity from that. We have total liberation to go where we want to go from there. And, you know, so they're contradictory in the way that a trickster can be. But it's in that contradiction that we can, you know, laugh and we can uh, move ahead. And uh, yeah, I, I also really liked how you talked about Batman there, because that was a particularly strong theme that comes up uh, in your book, uh, because Dana, in very many ways, parallels Bruce Wayne, uh, you know, in that she's like a billionaire living in a penthouse who goes on, you know, like vigilante level. Uh, Drive you know, cool black right. car. Cool black car, exactly. Cool black car. Um, and, you know, she's from Gotham of the future. Uh, so, yeah, I really, I picked up on that uh, really strongly. And, uh, yeah, I was just wondering uh, if you could speak about, you know, like what that, where you see, you know, her and Batman kind of coming together. Or anything about that. Damn, that's a really good question. Well, I mean, ultimately, it goes back to the platonic idea of the philosopher king or the guardian of the republic. Uh, so, you know, what I argued in my essay on on Batman, which is titled Gotham Guardian and Lovers of Sophia, is that especially in the Christopher Nolan films and particularly in uh, The Dark Knight, you see Batman being depicted as an instantiation of the, uh, you know, Plato's idea of the philosopher king or guardian. Um, and, you know, uh, with the full awareness of the fact that the Guardian has to, at times, resort to the use of noble lies in order to protect the spirit of the people uh, and to um, engage in machinations that outmaneuver an enemy uh, and put one in a more favorable position for ultimate victory. Right. So I think, you know, one of the most horrifying things about the Dark Knight film is that to some extent, Nolan shows that the Joker was right, that if Batman had told the people of Gotham the truth about Harvey Dent, their spirit would have, in fact, been broken. So Harvey Dent had to be portrayed as this shining white knight, and mm -hmm. Bruce Wayne had to be fingered as this uh, well, or rather Batman had to be, you know, branded as this criminal who was responsible for all these murders that were actually committed by Dent or Two-Face. Uh, and so, you know, he has to bear the burden of becoming this wanted, hunted, dark knight uh, and, and perpetuating this falsehood in order to ultimately uh, live to fight another day and to save the city in the end. And so Dana Avalon in Uberman also repeatedly resorts to the use of noble lies and various machinations um, against those people who would want to, you know, choke off any, uh, you know, any further human evolution, people who want to uh, retard and, and uh, you know, regress society. So, yeah, although I would say also that Dana Avalon is somewhat more of a, how can I put this? Uh, cutthroat and uh, merciless assassin than Batman, right? I mean, absolutely. She, there's a lot of Hassan Sabah uh, in her. There's a lot of yeah. the order of assassins in her um, mm -hmm. as compared to Batman, who was a, a rebel against the League of Shadows and was advocating much more of a uh, Buddhist path um, than I think Dana Avalon does. Yeah, that's interesting to, to note, too. I mean, a Avalon's coming from a future where the apocalypse really has happened. So, you know, that's uh, that changes. I mean, that, I feel like that's fundamental to the identity of the assassin from what you write in Rainy Leviathan about how, you know, they they really did say the apocalypse was now 
And so, you know, everything was permitted, you know, the, uh, the truth, every was truth is what works. Um, you know, yeah. Jeff, before you go on, let me just, that, that's a brilliant observation. Uh, you know, sometimes people read a book that you, you've written and they see things in it that you yourself haven't seen. I mean, that's the nature of, I think, a, you know, a uh, creative process driven by the subconscious. And I think books that are very, um, uh, you know, deliberately planned and, uh, contrived in an overly conscious way really don't amount to art. All art has to ultimately come from out of the subconscious. And what happens when you write from out of the subconscious is that often people will see things in your book that you yourself didn't realize you were doing. So you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm just realizing this now in reflection on what you said that, yeah, Dana Avalon is an assassin who comes from the end of the world. The world has already ended for her. So just like the uh, assassins at Alamut in medieval Iran, whose you know uh, axiom was basically apocalypse now that you know the, the world has ended, right? And therefore everything is permitted in this struggle for liberation. Her ethos is very much shaped by the fact that you know things can't get any worse than they've gotten in the world that she in the collapsing world that she comes from. She really is coming. Uh, back to us from out of uh, the end of the world. Uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent observation. Yeah, well, I feel like I really did read a lot into what's going on. That's one of the great things about, um, I think, the written word uh, in general. Um, that's something that we talk a little bit, you talk about in the uh, phenomenal authorization, you know, how there's this um, you know, you talk about the power where something can become authorized. Well, when you're saying that suddenly it's like a new sphere of reality has become accessible to us and we can now move into and expand uh, those ideas. So, um, like I had this big synchronicity when I was writing my tarot book, which you have, where I was writing about uh, language being the root of technology with the wheel chapter. I, I re uh, interpreted the tarot's wheel card as language explaining kind of like um, man's original gift. And then I read Phenomenal Authorization. And then you go into, you know, the three authors, authorization, authority, and authorship. And I thought, you know, what was super cool is I decided to look up the origin of the word author. And I found out it actually traces to the word augury, which in Latin means increase, originate, or promote which I think is obviously now connected to Spenta Mayu, uh, you know, the progressive consciousness. This is the increasing. Um, yeah, and then I also found something interesting is that the, and I, I'll send you this graphic. Look, I just punched this into Google etymology. You can see this, but the the, 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 the TH in author, uh, apparently is coming from authentic. So I found that very interesting. And I was wondering, could you maybe elaborate what you think authenticity's relationship is with creativity and authorship? Wow, another fantastic question. Um, you know, this is one of, Martin Heidegger has been a deep influence on me, okay? Uh, I would say Heidegger's among a handful of philosophers who have fundamentally shaped my own thinking. And, um, that I hope to uh, be a successor to uh, in, in terms of furthering their trajectory <clears throat> of thought. And one of the things that's most misunderstood about Heidegger is this central concept of authenticity in his work. Mm -hmm. Because people typically think of authenticity in terms of like sincerity and lack of pretense and uh, thoroughgoing honesty and just being a person who, uh, let's say, is totally transparent, right? Uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, that's the conventional uh, conception of authenticity. But that's not what Heidegger means when he turns authenticity into this fundamental concept um, of his uh, existential ontology. In the part of being in time, where Heidegger starts to hash out this idea of Eigentlichkeit or authenticity. He discusses the place of the poet as the most fundamental kind of author, because see, he thinks that poetry is the most essential form of language. 
Poetry is the form of language that shapes the world of a people at the most fundamental level. And so it's the poets of a people who need not necessarily write poetry in a literal sense, but you know, like even great filmmakers could be the, considered a poet of a, of a people like Andrei Tarkovsky in Russia, for example, right, is a poet, even though his, actually Tarkovsky was literally a poet. But even in the medium of film, Tarkovsky is acting as a poet. In any case, uh, Heidegger said that as is best exemplified by the poets of a people, Eigentlichkeit or authenticity is about understanding the heritage of your people, which you're vouchsafed with, the heritage of your people, which you subconsciously um, uh, not just absorb, but which structures the matrix of your being uh, at a basic level from childhood onwards, growing up in a certain society. Authenticity is about taking that heritage and appropriating it in a way that opens up new possibilities in the future for your folk and that does it with a view to the concrete existential situation that you find yourself in. Wow. So not every moment in history is equally conducive of authenticity in someone who has a poetic nature. There are certain moments in history which we think of as crises or emergencies where the world of meaning of a people is brought under question. And it's in those moments that actually there's the possibility for the greatest authenticity, meaning for a radical reappropriation of the heritage of one's people for the sake of further development, right? And so anyone who has a, okay, you could be the most dead earnest person in the world. You could be the most sincere, transparent person in the world. But if your relationship to your heritage is a static one, if it's ossified, if you see your heritage as, as mummified, basically, if you're a conservative, a traditional you're not authentic. No yeah. authentic, no conservative is an authentic person. Every conservative is a fraud. They could be the most, they could be the most sincere person in the world, the most earnest person in the world, but their very nature is that they are a fraud mm -hmm. okay? because they're betraying creativity. Authenticity wow. is always being true, not just to a heritage that you've made part of yourself, which that itself is a task to take a heritage and make it your own. But authenticity is also being true to the creative force that's calling forth this poetic power. And so, yeah, that's that's what authenticity is about. It's not, you know, just uh, sincerity in some superficial sense. Actually, authenticity might involve, you know, propagating certain noble lies and weaving certain fictions that are ultimately constructive. Yeah. Wow, man. Integrity with deep integrity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I just love hearing that um, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, I've not read Heidegger. I don't speak German uh, like you. You do have this, uh, you know, quad. You speak four different languages. I know Persian, French and German. Um, and, you know, Heidegger said that only certain thoughts can be thought in German, you know. And that, to me, also goes back to this idea of authorship as well, going back to the language and how there is this this tradition that's within it. And so I, I've li really appreciated your descriptions of Heidegger because everything that you write about, you know, I, I kind of feel like when I read one of your books, I'm actually getting like 25 books into one book and you're doing such a good job of serving them up one after another, like connecting them. So I'm not just getting the best ideas. I'm getting them all laid out in a really good format. And so I appreciate that that connection with Heidegger, and I also now understand more so why you've really taken up the torch of Prometheus. You know, you started with Prometheus and Atlas, and that description right there just takes it right to it is about the creativity. It's about the moving forward. And this is the part now where I want to move to what we were talking about at the very beginning of our conversation, which is about evolution uh, being exclusionary. And that's because what you said reminded me of a quote that comes from the very end of Iranian Leviathan, which I'll tie into Uberman. Uh, and this is where you say, uh, cultural appropriation is very constructive in catalyzing innovation based on cultural mutation and furthering the evolution of consciousness rather than the stagnation of humanity in a ghettoized world full of regressively tribal cultures. 
and you say this is you know cultural appropriation is good cultural misappropriation is where it's it's wrong and uh yeah i definitely heard you referring to this when you were describing how you know authenticity is about taking what's been given to you and then moving forward um and so before we move on to the next part of this where i'm going to talk about that is there anything you want to say to that um no i mean i think uh, the passage that you just quoted reiterates a lot of what i was saying about authenticity and heidegger i mean that's another way of of uh putting the same point yeah yeah exactly i was i was preparing for this in the right way so uh going to one of the most radical statements of your book uberman um and you know to recognize uberman we're talking about uh you know growth you know uber german meaning like over or up uh you say evolution is exclusionary uh you know evolution selects against the majority that failed to develop the mutations for environmental stress and so a few become progenitors at the expense of the many so i was wondering if we could de delve into some ideas about evolution um so for instance something interesting about evolution that i've noticed is that there has to be some kind of like a quantum jump feature in evolution uh because you know otherwise certain new species just wouldn't be able to uh you know outdo like if unless the the evolution was complete in like one generation you know then you'd have animals with like half a leg or like a new leg that never fully developed uh, you know i always see the the principle of the butterfly you know if it like a creature only learned how to like metamorphosize you know part of the way then it's you know it's vulnerable to prey so there is this quantum leap principle that happens and i think it has something to do with the simulation theory so um i was wondering if you'd first talk a little bit about what you think the nature of evolution is in a quantum uh jumping sense Okay, my answer to this is going to be a little bit complex. So let me try to lay this out as carefully and slowly as possible. The majority of evolutionary biologists today who are basing themselves on the Darwinian conception of evolution and who have a reductive uh, mindset who want who, who at least defer to the physicists who think that everything should ultimately be explained in terms of particle physics and who think that let's say organic chemistry is a more fundamental science than biology and then particle physics is more fundamental than organic chemistry right they have this reductive vision of the sun of the sciences most evolutionary biologists who work based on the darwinian evolutionary theory and within this reductive mechanistic paradigm think that evolution by natural selection is a question of a uh, it's a question of random causation that the mutations are random and the selection for them under environmental pressures is entirely contingent in other words it could have gone any way any which way uh there could never have been beings, uh, there, there could have never been any beings that are remotely like humans. And it could be that there are no humanoid beings anywhere else in the cosmos because there could be any number of random pathways for mutation and selection by environmental pressure, right? And yeah. so this is, this is a way of thinking about quote unquote life. Actually, what I'm gonna say is this is no conception of life at all. But this is a way of thinking about quote unquote life uh, as if it were particle physics. Mm -hmm billiard ball kind of particle. Yeah, randomness, yep. And so what I would say is that if that's your conception of evolution, then you have to admit that given an eternal time horizon, there is only a certain number of configurations of entities in the world, right? So let's say all biological entities are reducible to organic chemistry and everything going on on an organ organic chemistry level is ultimately a question of particle physics. There's only a certain number of ways that all of the particles in the cosmos can arrange themselves mm -hmm. uh, going forward into the future with an infinite time horizon. In other words, let's say time is, is infinite, right? Let's say that time goes, goes on to eternity. Uh, then 
you're going to run out of possible configurations of every particle in the cosmos, mm -hmm. which means that evolution is an absurdity. The concept of evolution is a concept of transformative growth. There is no transformative growth if you have a finite matrix of possibilities, which ultimately exhausts itself. And then, as Nietzsche illustrated with his thought experiment of the eternal recurrence, the same possibilities begin repeating themselves over the course of eternity, right? Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, how I see evolution is as a concept about the nature of life, which is fundamentally contrary to that kind of reductive mechanistic thinking. Yeah. Evolution is about actual transformative growth, which means that there's a possibility for transformation, which is undefined and unlimited indefinitely forwards. Yeah. And that's something difficult to wrap your mind around because you have to get outside of mathematical analysis in order to be able to fathom that. Okay. And I think that uh, Henri Bergson did well with this in his book, Creative Evolution, in, in you know, attempting to understand transformative growth in terms of what he called the elan vital or the life force. Uh, that has as its maxim development and creativity, right? He, he called it in French, uh, evolution créatrice, the evolutionary force of the creatrix, as if like there is this mind in the future that is soliciting infinite growth. Wow. Uh, and so I, you know, I draw from that beginning even in Prometheus and Atlas, where I put Bergson next to Heidegger. Yeah. In order to develop this evolutionary framework for my thinking. Yeah, I really do think that's great to clarify too. I, you know, the that's basically like the the you know ontology of your whole work right there is that the universe couldn't end because you know the end of time would prevent it from happening by you know retrofitting more creativity in. And this, you know, corresponds to Freya Band, I believe you referred to him, and the, you know, the way that even the laws of nature can be shifted, you know, that, you know, that's a part of uh, what's happening is that, like in phenomenology, you know, so we also have that uh, going on. And yeah. yeah. Let's make a note about that, that, you know, um, uh, Paul Feyerabend, uh, his Fair. ontological, he's been called an ontological anarchist. <laughs> and... I mean, he was also, he had, you know, far left political leanings uh, uh, too. So maybe to some extent he was also at least flirting with political anarchy. But in any case, um, I'm definitely very much aligned with him in terms of his ontological anarchism uh, insofar as he rejected any overarching structure that would be finite and in principle measurable. I mean, this is where, you know, Laplace, in the in the enlightenment uh had this conception that if you only had a mind that was powerful enough if you had like a uh well basically an omnipotent and omniscient god that uh entity would be able to survey all of the possibilities of configurations for entities going forward into the future uh so as to be able to come up with a perfectly accurate projection of future events, right? This is Laplace's, you know, uh, uh, some people call it Laplace's demon, whatever, you know, a godlike intelligence that could do that. And and together with someone like Feyerabend, and on an ontological and epistemological level, I deny that such a thing is even possible. I think it's a nonsensical conception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I see that uh, we're returning then to the trickster archetype, uh, most certainly, you know, uh, and I, I did have something in mind when I was speaking about quantum leaps. I was reminded of Zarathustra's prologue when uh, he sees the tightrope walker between the two towers and the tightrope walker as a metaphor for humanity's own tightrope walking between the beast and the Superman. And this is everyone's, uh, you know, amazed at this tightrope walker who is so high up. And then out of the, the, you know, one tower, suddenly the door opens up and then, uh, you know, a gesture starts walking 
forward on the rope. And he, you know, he says, you know, hurry up, pale face, I'll tickle you with my heel. And then he leaps over the tightrope walker. And, you know, he's like, you're slowing your betters down. And the tightrope walker falls and to his death. But uh, yeah, I felt like that almost seems to imply that the fastest way across this bridge that we're walking right now involves this kind of level of absurdity that comes from, you know, being beyond any kind of finite, almost def defined by this line of the tightrope. We have to, you know, we move beyond that line and we, we get to grow up. Now, the the interesting thing I wanted to lead into from that was um, I was wondering what do you think is more Promethean? Okay, so uh, evolution is exclusionary. You say this. Um, but, you know, Nietzsche has this... Okay, so first of all, I want to reference uh, something from Peter J. Carroll. Uh, he wrote this book, Liebernal, here. I was reading that. And it says, uh, it was talking about evolution here, where he says, overall, the inherent superiority of the most flexible, adaptable, inclusive, and complex creatures, cultures, and men uh, and ideas always wins out. So the most inclusive uh, person is going to be the most likely to evolve. But on the other hand, evolution itself might be exclusionary. So yeah, and Peter, that Peter Carroll, I was recommended to read him from Siloan. Uh, so I thought that would be a relevant connection. But on the other hand, you have Nietzsche who is saying, you know, he doesn't want any he, one man to have too many virtues. You know, he says it's uh, um, one virtue is more than two because it's more of a hook on which a man may hang, you know, his doom may hang on. And then he also called men like a ball of wild snakes that seldom have peace from one another because there's all these virtues that are competing with themselves at the same time. So I was wondering, what do you think is the more Promethean outlook? You know, total inclusivity, or would you rather see a focus on just one type of an area? Well, first of all, the... Uh quote from Nietzsche is referring to personal psychology, whereas what you were saying about uh, Carol, uh, this uh, chaos magician, yeah. is uh, referring to social psychology and, and sociology. So mm -hmm. there, there's a, you know, there isn't a, a strict comparison and contrast there um, because they're dealing on two different scales. Uh, but what I would say is that they're both right in the sense that um, I do think that the most the most inclusive society possible is the best society. Yeah. But that has to be parsed word for word. The most inclusive society possible, meaning up to the point where the social fabric will disintegrate because you've combined too many disparate things, you've brought too many different social forces together that are incapable of ultimately catalyzing a fusion or being part of some kind of a uh, collective metamorphosis that yields a new form of life, right? The point yeah. of bringing all kinds of disparate elements together is not to have a hodgepodge that remains indefinitely, you know, dichotomous and, and uh, you know, uh, violently multifarious. The point of bringing all these different forces together is to develop a dialectic between them which ultimately leads beyond all of them into some fusion that represents a categorically new form of life. And, yeah, and, and yeah. that's, so for one great example that's been central to all of my work and is close to my heart is the example of the Persian empire, the first Persian empire, right? Yeah. I come in at Persian empire, which adopted Babylon as its capital after it conquered Babylon, was the first explicitly affirmatively cosmopolitan world society. It brought together people from all kinds of cultures and ethnic backgrounds under a single standard. And uh, yet it was able to maintain its cohesion for, at this point, as long as the United States, because it wasn't simply some modus vivendi, you know, some way of just getting along amongst a fractious group of people who, you know, could just as well have, uh, you know, uh, uh, slaughtered each other competing over resources or whatever. The, the Hachamanashid Empire succeeded because it was able to take this diverse group of people and cultures and create a higher unity from out of it. And that higher unity, which, 
you know, some people would like to consider Zoroastrian, but which I would say was actually Mithraic in its spirit, yeah. that higher unity became then the foundation for this phenomenon of Iranian civilization that I've written about. Iranian civilization was really born through this fusion of different peoples and cultures, albeit with the Persians playing a kind of guiding, uh, uh, shepherding role, right? So yeah. I do think that, that you know, those are the strongest and the best cultures who manage to become you know, super cultures or civilizations based on a fusion of various cultural horizons. Uh, but I also think that, going back to your quote from Nietzsche, and also to what I was saying about Heidegger and authenticity earlier, the men, and hopefully also women, who are capable of bringing those diverse cultures together and maintaining their cohesion and then ultimately gestating a new form of life from out of it, those are people who have to be capable of simplifying themselves and of becoming elemental in some way, in the way uh, Nietzsche is describing. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, okay, granted, deep thinkers who want to become men of action are going to have a very violent inner life psychically right and they definitely are going to be complex people but that imposes upon them all the more the burden of simplifying themselves and becoming elemental and unless they're capable of doing that they will not be able to exercise the kind of sovereign decision that is required to you know basically form a poetic unity from out of this kind of cacophony uh, that mm -hmm. you find in such cosmopolitan societies. And I think that, you know, one of the reasons that America is failing badly in this project that Hachomanashit Iran succeeded so brilliantly in is that we lack those kinds of people in America in positions of leadership. I perhaps like Abraham Lincoln, you know, perhaps Lincoln was such a person. Yeah. And, you know, where are the Lincolns of our time? And if yeah. they don't show up soon, uh, I'm afraid this is all going to end very badly here in this country for us. Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head when you talked about the elemental, you know, we need to become more elemental, um, you know, in that way that it's almost like shamanic. We need to access the inner shaman, um, which again goes back to Mithraic, Mithraic uh, traditions with, um, you know, shamanism kind of coming in from the Caucasus over into uh, Southeast and East Asia. And uh, yeah, I thought that there's also, um, you know, in the book we have like uh, some more Mithraic symbolism in what's probably my favorite part of the, like my, the probably my, the most spellbinding part of the book is this very end where we, um, we do return to the Gorgon symbolism in the deep dark lair. You know, I don't want to give away anything because everyone wants to, you know, should read the book. But um, yeah, I thought, you know, your own, uh, last name is a kind of variation on the word Gorgon, um, which I have a Gorgon behind me on my wall back here. Uh, so I'll send you a link so you can get a nice full, full image of that. But you know, your own Jason G Gorgani. And so the Gorgon as being, um, yeah, Mithra's uh, consort, Anahita, and also mother. And uh, yeah, I, I think that it would be a kind of an interesting place to tie this into uh, the Persian culture, and even those paintings that you uh, cite in the book as well, which kind of have a sort of, uh, you know, violent, chaotic, uh, but then also sexual uh, side to them. That's interesting. Um, I wonder if I've ever seen those paintings in that way before. I think, you know, probably on some subconscious level I have. Um, these are paintings that uh, I grew up with. They were painted by that um, co-author of the Star Child screenplay that I mentioned earlier, Khosro Yahyai. And uh, people who read Uberman can see in the chapter uh, titled Star Child how those paintings came into my possession. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think there there is something, you know, I mean, I offer this kind of surrealist symbological interpretation of the content of those paintings in Uberman. They ultimately wind up in Dana Avalon's apartment uh, yeah. in the turret of her penthouse. Um, so they're referenced twice in the book, once in the chapter Star Child and once toward the very end of the book 
when they wind up in Dan Avalon's apartment. I've seen very few successful examples of modern art that is also Persian or Persian art that's also, you know, authentically modern and not just attempting to be, you know, I don't know, avant-garde in some superficial Western sense, right? Yeah. The painting yeah, doing both, it for the point of doing it. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, these paintings are both quintessentially Persian uh, and in spirit, and also modern, you know, in the way that the best works of surrealism are modern. In terms of my name, it it's interesting. I mean, I don't know how many people wind up with a name that they they find, you know, truly significant to them and to their interests in life and uh, to, you know, what they explore on the, on a deep level. Um, but in my case, that does happen to be true because Georgiani is a Arabized mispronunciation of Gorgani. When the Arabs came to Iran, they changed the name of uh, Gorgan to Georgian because they don't have a, a ga sound in the Arabic language. All the ga's become ja sounds. And Gorgan is a huge area in northern Iran around the Caspian Sea. There's a city that's named that. But Gor Greater Gorgon is a whole area uh, that basically was called that because there were. Okay, so now this is this is the question. They say, people say it was called that because there were wolves running loose in this area, and Gorg means wolf in Persian and other older Iranian languages. It comes from the old Indo-European varg or warg, uh, which means to tear apart, and. That's where the name of the Gorgons comes from, the Gorgons, because they tore men apart. And so and the Gorgons also were worshipped by Scythian and Sarmatian peoples around the Caspian Sea region. But the real reason why that area is called Gorgon isn't only because there are actually wolves there. It's because this was the region where the Scythians would repeatedly come down and they'd invade the territory of the Persians and the Medes. And the Scythian war banner was the wolf's head. So this banner that you see in, in Game of Thrones uh, of House Stark, the wolf's head banner, that was the banner of the Scythians, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, who were demonized as wolves by the Persians. So that whole area became known as Gorgon, or the Greeks called it Hyrcania. And so Georgiani basically is, you know, uh, it's a reference to uh, Hyrcania and to the land of the wolf totem, uh, namely the Scythian war banner. Yeah, that's just amazing. Uh, good to know about this too. I didn't know it, but you know, my ancestors are Scots, lots of Scottish, you know, and then you told me that they're also Scythians who, Scythians who migrated uh, very far west, which was nice to find out. And, you know, the wolf yeah, toad. The Scottish uh, Kings Chronicles. I mean, the Scots say this about themselves. In their oldest um, royal chronicles, they say that their founding kings were migrant uh, Scythians. Yeah, that's, yeah, see, there's, and then, the, I don't know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, too. I think the Scott Nomatron also, I forget how, I forget how to pronounce it, but, uh, yeah, they also are connected to Egypt as well. Um, something about, uh, like, one of the daughters of Amenhotep, I'm sorry, of, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, the golden eye guy. Uh, it's, it's not important, but, yeah, um, very interesting well, connections there. going on way back then that involved that involved northern Iran, the Scythians, the people who became the Celts, including the Scots, and ancient Egypt. There was a whole triangle going on there in, in, in yeah. ancient times, which Edgar Cayce, uh, of all people, was kind of onto. He, he said that this, I think the guy was called Rata or something like that, was an ancient Egyptian uh, priest who began the line of the Shamasu Hor, the followers of Horus, the prehistoric line, a uh, priestly line of ancient Egypt. And this Rata character, who Casey claimed worked with the Atlanteans to set up civilization in Egypt, this guy was supposedly from the Caucasus region of Iran. Uh, and then you have these stories about how the Scots are genetically connected to the ancient Egyptians. And they're doing genetic yeah, tests yeah. on the Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, yeah. Legitimate. Yep, the King Tut, yeah, that came through. Yeah, so there is that connection. And then also, you know, some of the reliefs of the you know, the Egyptians from back then having blue eyes and red hair, you know, and Horus of the blue eyes set with red hair, you know, so that's its own large connection. And yeah, there is definitely, I mean, you know, Ireland too, with the whole, I, I, um, sorry, 
uh, Aryan, you know, is another way of saying Ireland, Ar, you know, the Ari. Are cognates. Erin, the Celtic name for Ireland, Erin and Iran are cognates, and they mean exactly the same thing. And then, you know, yeah. there's a, a place in Iran on the Caspian Sea, again, in, in Hyrtania, there's a place in Iran where there's a language spoken that's called Gilak. And yeah, wow. lo and behold, these Gilaki people, like Gaelic, Gilak, play the bagpipe. They play an ancient form of the bagpipe. And they also have this cruel wit that's very similar to Irish humor. Uh, and anyway, their textile patterns are similar. So yeah, it's it's an interesting. Yeah, don't you also have some Irish heritage yourself? Is your mother? Yeah, I'm a quarter Irish. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting, kind of like making the full connection there, you know, kind of like reunifying the cultural drift with uh, with your work. And that's so awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, so I got some just some other random stuff to sit, like questions that kind of came up, things that I observed. Um, for instance, I was just curious, like what your advice would be for helping people to, uh, you know, evolve, mutate. You know, if you wanted to share uh, some thought about that, you know, why do people choose to be enslaved kind of related to that as well? Just wondering what your perception is of that. I think that the only responsible answer to that is that there's no general advice. I think that you have to meet people depending on where they're coming from mm -hmm. on an individual basis and that the best thing you can do uh, which I'm trying to do, uh, is to hold up a standard. I mean, like raise a flag, literally, okay? Uh, to create a beacon, to light a torch that people can be drawn toward based on, uh, you know, identifying in that light the fire that's burning within themselves, sure. right? That calls them toward that beacon uh, and that makes that standard speak to them. So one can create a kind of point of congregation and develop a certain philosophical worldview that potentially could ground a new form of society. But then what fosters evolutionary growth for a person is going to be you know, radically individual. And I don't think there's any general advice for that because you know, people's paths are so uh, differentiated and, and uh, you know, individuated what, you know, uh, people have gone through and where they find themselves as they struggle with uh, becoming part of an evolutionary process is going to be very different from case to case. Yeah, uh, okay, so maybe like a general though, what do you think about leads people towards preventing this evolutionary jump? You know, what's the, what's the lure there? Fear. Fear. fear, fear, above all fear. So and you know, then there's the temptation to make the superficial statement, be fearless or cultivate fearlessness. Well, that's nice, you know, but you can't tell somebody to do that and expect that they're going to do it in any authentic way, because people can don all kinds of psychical armor that, uh, you know, whereby they dupe themselves into believing that they've become fearless, when in fact, all they've done is further uh, ensconce themselves in various, you know, you know um, self-delusions that are going to actually ultimately uh, constrain them and inhibit their growth. Sure, sure. And I think that we have a rampancy of fear now because we don't um, honor the darkness that they used to with the Gorgon. You know, we used to, like, appreciate the, you know, the scary monster and even worship it, you know, because of probably that principle right there, you know, and if we accepted that, we could move on. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's one reason why I'm definitely appreciating the Gorgon more so now, uh, just seeing that element, that side of it is like, you know, look at it and then, you know, even try to love it in some way, uh, which is, which is uh, a way of, you know, also hearkening back to uh, talking about the relationship we want to have with the uh, super organism of the future. You know, we do want to be able to uh, transcend our own biases and be willing to open up to the strange and beautiful and scary at the same time. Um, 
Yeah, there's something else I read in your book that I thought was really interesting. I wanted to hear um, one of the tech psychotronics, huge part of the book, uh, you know, the Soviet, the behind the Iron Curtain, the particular, uh, you know, mentalist experiments they were running over there. And one of the topics has to do with um, psychic infiltration and then also psychic assassination. Um, and so I was wondering, um, also in that book, you talk about particular tactics to like, for instance, throw off these maneuvers, you know, people, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, when I found out about this, is the, is the cure worse than the poison, honestly? But um, I was wondering, uh, for someone of your intelligence and your, you know, your um, surroundings, you know, is, is it going to be a lot harder for someone to get inside your head? Because apparently to really, to psychically assassinate someone, you have to be, you have to be able to walk you know, not just a mile in their shoes, but like weeks in their shoes, months to really get and literally almost embody that person. And I'm just wondering, you know, if someone is as smart as you, you, is it like there's there's very few people who could really get into your head is what I would imagine, you know, especially with all the great thoughts you're having. I don't think it's a question of smart. No. I think there are very smart people, people much smarter than I am, um, who are vulnerable on account of insecurities that they have. Um, you know, people who are very intelligent, maybe very well read or, or have a very powerful analytical intellect, mm. but who have deep insecurities, they, they are more vulnerable to attacks like that. I think that, and this is a, you know, this is unfortunate, you know, there are, there are a lot of things that are true that are very unfortunate. This is one of them. Okay. That there are people who are not smart at all. In fact, you know, Maybe they're pretty dense, but they have a very strong personality. They have, you know, Plato differentiated the soul into the noetic aspect of the soul, the phrenis, which we identified with the solar plexus, the kind of sense of integrity and courage and duty that a soldier has, right? And then the lowest, the basest part of the soul, which he identified like with the uh, genitals and whatever, right? The, yeah. the you know, appetite, if the appetite, if uh, natural soul. part, yeah. yeah. So I think it's a question of what Plato called the phrenis, the, the solar plexus aspect of the soul. That could be very strong in somebody who's not much of an intellect, but that uh, wherewithal and sense of self and uh, you know um, groundedness and confidence, really, that sense of integrity, personal integrity, is going to create a psychic shield around a person. Yeah. And so, you know, there's something to be said for Plato's uh, developmental model, which is integral to his proposal for how the education system should be restructured in Republic, where he says that you have to develop the soul from the bottom up. And, wow. it, you know, it's going to actually be, it, you can see this in the way that he proposes children should be uh, raised and trained in Republic. It's actually not only worthless, it's worse than worthless. It's dangerous if you cult cultivate someone's higher intellect without, you know, them developing this kind of solar plexus sense of integrity and groundedness and, uh, you know, courage and spiritedness. Because yeah, yeah. otherwise, you know, first of all, there's a danger the person's going to implode. Then there's the danger that you're talking about, that this person is going to be subject to external psychical influences that could be detrimental not only to themselves, but to society. Uh, and there's also the danger that this person who lacks integrity, who lacks ethos, which you find ethos mainly on that solar plexus level of the psyche, person lacking ethos will take their well-developed analytical mind and use it for all kinds of deleterious purposes. Sure. Yeah, I, I see where you're, you're going with that. That's very interesting. Um, that. Wow, to think about that. Yeah, that's uh, so it is about, you know, having that personal level of awareness and that, yeah, we are set up as a society to be vulnerable at this level. I mean, with this, the way the school systems work, um, I saw a joke, uh, a meme a little bit ago, and it's like, the you know, they you go to school to think university and the first thing they tell you is this textbook costs one hundred and thirty dollars, you know, and it's like where's the mind there you know it's it's really it's an entrainment system 
Um, I heard that it was originally set up by the Prussians to basically catalyze, uh, you know, industry industrial values like just conformity, you know, steady schedule. So, you know, pretty much have to implode uh, like all of society, you know, to basically start over again with new values. And that's what I really love about Prometheism. It's shameless about its, you know, commitment to uh, moving beyond the um, the preconceptions of our days, you know, and it's unfortunate, but it's like I've heard science proceeds, you know, by coffin nails rather than by, you know, new theses because there is this like such a hard prejudice against, you know, these professors are just tenured. They just want to hold on to their positions. Nothing will change. And then um, the other element of the of the book, which I think is is really tough to talk about is the, you know, the die spider organization the you know that part of it comes in too eventually in the book so while we also have dana doing hair heroics we also still are contending with the shadow force of you know the breakaway civilization or you know maybe other people know it as just the nazis who escaped germany and came to the u.s and pretty much started the military industrial complex and which has hijacked you know the the world sphere uh, you know, so we're still kind of in the very first world war still going on since that that whole thing started. Um, yeah, Carrie, comment on any of that? Well, I mean, did you want to take the um, the question about the spider? Uh, yep. or some people call it the fourth Reich in any particular direction or I guess I guess I uh, I just uh, well, one thing that came up to me um, was I've been reading Carl Jung's Red Book, and I found it interesting. We talked a little bit about the trickster archetype, and he said something about, like, the, the supreme meaning being right there with absurdity, which is, you know, it's a weird thing to say. But he did have this particular vision of World War One starting, which I feel like is important, because if it's true that we're still fighting the original war, that, you know, World War One led to World War Two, World War Two never ended. You know, so really it goes back to what started World War One, and he has a thesis about what started World War One, and he basically said that with the death of God, uh, you know, that Nietzsche talks about the death of the ideal, and it happens at the, you know, not everyone's accepting it, but everyone's tacitly accepted that God is dead, and so the ideal died, and the ideal is really embodied as like the hero, so he he analogized it to like Siegfried, you know, which again is a German type of an entrance and so the death of the heroic and uh yeah he said that it was this death of the heroic that led to just this mass shedding of blood because people literally couldn't even handle what they had what had happened so they almost needed like an external manifestation of the internal process that's going on and i definitely see this connection between this and and uberman which is about rising up the superman and i i guess on the side of the die spider you know, these forces, it's interesting. It's like they do represent the side of traditionalism that's holding us back to, you know, what's gone before, whereas like what you're propel proposing is to go beyond that. So yeah, it's it's kind of a weird question sometimes because yeah, it's like, are they supermen who are, you know, trying to bring about uh, something or, you know, are they traditionalists? Are they, you know, are they pulling us back? And, you know, of course, then there's the whole time travel Thing that gets pulled into. There is a passage in, uh, I think it's, the book is translated as the gay science, which is a rather unfortunate English translation, the joyous, the joyous wisdom, Fröhliche mm Wissenschaft. -hmm. Uh, in that book, uh, there is a passage where he's talking about the death of God. It's a kind of preface to Thus Book Zarathustra. Mm -hmm. And Nietzsche says, you know, now that we've murdered God, that the mightiest has bled under our knife, you know, what rites and rituals must we invent to cleanse ourselves, right? Yeah. And I think that speaks very much to this Jungian interpretation of the First World War that you were uh, oh, laying there. Terrifying to even mention it's, it that way, yes. This is what Nietzsche is getting at. And Nietzsche also saw it, by the way. Nietzsche said that there would be world wars, and that these world wars were ultimately going to end with some great global cataclysm that represented humanity's con uh, confrontation 
with its conscience on the deepest level and with the question of what man ought to become. Yeah. He, he sees this in Ece Homo. Nietzsche has this also prophecy of, of world war. And so, yeah, I, I think that that Jungian inter interpretation is very right. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you got to bear in mind, which I bring up in the part of Uberman where I'm talking about avant-garde art movements, you know, the, the surrealists and Dadaists and so forth, and what is the nature of modernism as compared to postmodernism? All of that comes up in Uberman. And so another thing that you got to keep in mind with respect to the First World War is that this was the period where we had the beginning of all these avant-garde art movements, right? Yeah. Dadaism, futurism, surrealism. And so we were on the brink of this Promethean burst of creativity and the evolutionary mutation of humanity. And then, you know, this Dionysian frenzy, this violent madness erupted, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think represents a struggle ultimately not between any particular nations and empires, but a struggle between the forces of tradition and conservatism, the force of constraint that Zarathustra calls Engeraminu or Ahriman, and then the progressive mentality or Sepantaminu, the, uh, the future oriented mind, what I call Promethea. And that's really the nature of the struggle. And so when you ask, you know, uh, about the breakaway civilization and whether they're really Ubermenschen or whether they're actually people who are trying to hold us back, I think, you know, that's the great question. The great question is the struggle over the soul of those who control the technological singularity. And I don't believe that any human institution is monolithic. And part of what I'm trying to get people to understand and, you know, in reaffirming certain aspects of Nietzsche uh, is that facile categorizations of good versus evil are not constructive. And so yeah. I, I still hold out hope that there are people even within the breakaway civilization who, uh, maybe initially did have some futurist vision for how these singularity technologies could be used, right? I mean, after all, remember that F.T. Marinetti was a close collaborator of Benito Mussolini in the early days. It's only later that they had a falling out and one went in a conservative traditionalist direction and the other one stayed true to his futurism, albeit perhaps even in an excessive way. But the point is that, you know, th this matrix of what, later became, on the one hand, fascism, on the other hand, futurism, was complex. And it's possible that there is still a struggle within the soul of the breakaway civilization. And that, you know, we could prevail upon certain elements uh, in order to break us out of the situation that we find ourselves in today. Interesting. Yeah, it does seem to be like maybe the, you know, the same force like you talk about with uh, the last men you know, the same thing that creates the, you know, the race of degenerate human beings who, you know, lack, who are completely, you know, attached to all commodities and just like, you know, they, they think he said they lack the ability to self-despise and so they can't overcome themselves. And that, that same kind of event is also going to herald the Superman, you know, that's also bringing that on. So in that same way, you know, what World War One happens around the same time, all these arts are completely breaking loose and jazz also breaking through as well. That's, you know, a huge musical innovation that, you know, then leads to rock and roll and, you know, then later on to, you know, synth music and whatever, everything really. These same kind of things are paralleling, paralleling one another at the same time. And it's almost like we're running through you know, the same the same energy is running through these higher and lower currents in society. And uh, yeah, seems to me like people have the creativity, you know, they can you they can channel this energy into something solid, like you said, with authenticity, you know, but at the same time, if people are just clinging to what everyone else is telling them to do, you know, they are going to walk off a cliff. And, you know, they will do it with a smile on their face until they realize it's, you know, too late. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, you know, Nietzsche says in The Will to Power, uh, as, I've, as I've quoted in a number of my works, that 
the same social conditions, developments in communication and industry and, you know, basically modern society, the same conditions that will act as a breeding agent for the Uberman mm -hmm. will also lead to the paralysis and atrophy of man into uh, the untermenschen or subhuman form of life. And this is exactly what we're seeing happening today. Yeah, fascinating. And I, I have to say, I love what your work has done with how bold you've been with stepping out and doing just new things. You really put yourself on the line with this book by, you know, opening up to your, yourself so deeply, especially as someone who's aware of the consequences psychically of, you know, sharing this inner life. Um, yeah, so I thought I would share uh, an experience I had to just kind of also take a, a fun step forward. One thing you describe in the book is about how about one fifth of people have probably had some kind of closer encounter experience um, that they, you know, maybe aren't uh, like aware of or, you know, have suppressed or don't want to talk about. I'm pretty confident I've had one of these and I know it was around back in college. And uh, I, you know, I had to, some some weird sketchy stuff that was happening like in the middle of the night. And I just remember like a roommate of mine would start talking in his sleep at 3.33, which was, I was just, that was trippy. But then within a short period of that time, um, I, I actually found this one like black line on my shoulder, like right below my shoulder on my arm. And it was this hairline incision, like a perfectly flat black line. And it was, it was at, it wasn't like a pen mark. It was actually a part of my skin, just the perfect black line that was across there. And I, you know, I was like, this, this is clearly some sign that I've had some kind of interaction that I can't remember with something that interacted with me and had the technology to go into my arm and do something and then seal it off like perfectly. And so, yeah, I think that people should be aware of like just that possibility that you might have like something that's gone on in your reality and some kind of a memory wipe that happens at the same time with it, you know? And uh, yeah, I feel very, I, I don't feel afraid to, to admit that, but I do think it's interesting to admit what you don't know. From the little that I know about your life and and uh, where, where you're at now and the mm -hmm. kind of life that you lead now, that the story doesn't surprise me at all. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, uh, I think I, I can just leave it at that. I mean, you, you kind of live in Twin Peaks and, uh, yeah, the owls are out here. I think, uh, Twin Peaks is a great reference too to, uh, you know, Lynch as a clear person, person who is like a, po a poet in many ways, you know, he has yep. opened us to this, this red lodge. You know, we've been, I mean, I've walked through the red lodge. I, you know, I actually was haunted. I was, I stayed for years in a haunted lodge. And I experienced, you know, many forms of demonic possession running through those areas. And that lodge had actually been, um, had an enormous UFO sighting. Uh, my dad had this interaction with a red, huge orb that was the size of a garage, you know, not far from where he was at. And uh, yeah, he was sober at the time too. but. Yeah, I think that, like I said, Lynch, I really appreciate, you know, you refer to him a lot in your works. You say that you would love for him to do, um, a, you know, a documentary of your life. If someone was going to film, make a film out of it, you'd want him to do that. And at the time, I thought, well, that's interesting. And now that I've read the book, Oberman, and I think, wow, yeah, that would be super cool, you know, because I think that that's something that you did the, the, the best part of the of the atmosphere you crafted in the book, I think comes along in those last chapters when we're really like, you know, on the very edge of, of the storytelling. And I keep looking at how many pages are left in the book and I'm like, oh my God, how is it gonna, you know, how's it gonna go? There's, there's this moment when there's, you know, there's this haunted aspect that happens. And uh, yeah, you do a great job of really tapping into that side. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that a lot of people are going to have you know, profound synchronicities reading this book like I did when I was, you know, writing my own book. And then we had this amazing alignment with uh, authorization. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you described Lynch as a poet uh, at the beginning of those remarks there. And, you know, now that I think about it, going back to what I was saying about the poet 
of a people in the context of Heidegger's conception of authenticity, you know, and being in time. Uh, so their poet isn't necessarily someone who writes po poetry rather than prose, or even a writer at all. It could be a filmmaker. Now that I think about it, I mean, it, I'm hard pressed to name another person in our time who could be considered the greatest poet of the American people besides David Lynch. Uh, it seems yeah, yeah. to me, you know, I, I could be wrong, but right now I, I really can't think of anybody else who in our epoch could legitimately be described as the poet of the American folk. Uh, That's uh, yeah. really intense to describe um, because, you know, that uh, second season of Twin Peaks um, it's just so fascinating. Uh, there's, there's, there's like, for instance, the scene that's just the atom bomb explosion that, that going on and on. And, uh, I remember stepping away from that and just looking around my environment and being like, it's just a matter of time, you know, that this all could just go. And, uh, I didn't have the understanding I did today of what your work stands for, but essentially, you know, we are on a tightrope right now. And we literally do only have, you know, the clock is ticking, you know, the whole, you know, minutes to midnight. And, you know, there is an end in sight, which I didn't really realize before. But we have to keep our eyes on that goal, on that far tower. And once we can get there, you know, we can create the society where these technologies are under control and unnecessary at the same time, too. Um, and, then, yeah, I think the Prometheus movement really does, you know, offers us the, the 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 philosophical framework to get there. And so I really hope that people with the knowledge are getting exposed to this because they're the people who, you know, deserve to be empowered enough to, you know, take advantage of all that you've laid out, you know, the, and in such a coherent way. I'm so excited to go back and reread Prometheus and Atlas now that I've read all of your work. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just so grateful. Thank you, Jeff. Um... I, I think we'll prevail. I really do believe that uh, because I think that, you know, we have evolution on our side. Yes. And so yeah, it's a exactly. matter of time. It's only a matter of time, and it's a it's a matter of the cost at which we eventually do uh, prevail. But yeah. yeah, we're aligned with what Zarathustra called sepantaminu, and uh, the future is ours. Right. Yeah. Future, yeah. In a deeper sense. Right. The future belongs to us in the sense that the concept of the future is at the core of what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, um, on, that, that on that thought, you know, it, you know, we uh, we should probably leave uh, viewers with that hopeful uh, vision of, of uh, our eventual triumph, which I'm quite convinced of. Yeah, it exactly. And spent, you know, spent to Mayu, the progressive consciousness that's going on and uh, the cost, you know, is go that word spent is in there, you know. And so at the very end of it, we ourselves will be spent and we will be loving the spending of ourselves towards the things that we care about. And uh, so, you know. And I think, you know, it's also worth mentioning in that regard that Zarathustra's vision of the triumph of Spenta Menu is a very fiery vision. I mean, it's what he calls the Fereshgard, with you know that word, that root fresh being a cognate in Indo-European to our word fresh. It's the refreshening of the world. And his image of the Fereshgard uh, or the renovation of existence is of molten metal covering the whole earth. And yeah. of only certain beings coming through purified uh, from out of that fire. It's an alchemical metaphor. It's the fire of the forge that's going to transform us into superhuman beings in a positive sense. Uh, so, yeah, I, it will be a, a fiery end, but um, one that I think uh, allows us to undergo the metamorphosis that was represented by the uh, fire of the forge in the alchemical tradition. Yeah, and we work with our divine feminine on that same side as well. Dana Avalon, you know, as the Dana of the, you know, the guardian angel, the conscience that happens at that time. So, you know, open up to that side of ourselves and work with that energy. And yeah, I do think, I do have trust as well that she and we 
can, you know, do some ethic transformation. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. It's been an absolute pleasure and the first of many future conversations. I look forward to talking to you again before long. Yeah, sounds great, man. Have a great day. You too. Take care, my friend.